Welcome everyone to the Spiritual Underground Podcast. Once again, this is Dan coming to you from the studios at DTM Enterprises, my little wood shop in the backyard. Uh, got it all set up and uh, we have three microphones online today. Uh, hit these commercials real quick. Uh, go to spiritualunderground.org. That's where you can find show notes, links to the podcast, uh, contact me page. Uh, if you have any feedback or if you'd like to be on the show, uh, tell your story of recovery. Uh, that's a way you can get a hold of me. Um, also on that, if there's anything I can do recovery wise, you know, if I can help you, uh, I, I try to, that's, that's what I try to do today. So if you want to contact me through that, that is a way to do that. Uh, 12 step spiritual recovery is a book written by James Christopher Cohn. It is out on Amazon. You can get it in a hard copy or Kindle version. It is the, uh, Maybe I will say this, this might be a reach, but it is like the master's version of the 12 steps. Uh, everything's in there. Uh, how the steps may work for you if you are not, maybe you have the typical isms. Or if you do, uh, maybe it's a new way and uh, another way to level up or a uh, new experience, provide you with a new experience in the steps. So that's 12 Steps Spiritual Recovery by James Christopher Cohn. And finally, right now, the music wrapped around the podcast is by Darren Frank. So uh, you want to know any more about that gentleman and his music, and you can also listen to his story on the podcast uh, back just a little ways. Don't remember what episode number it is. Uh, today we have at the table uh, Nick and Mindy. And uh, one of the things, you know, I just tried to explore some things, and Nick brought this up as he left, and I'll probably just, uh, he explained it really well and probably better than I did or can so I'll probably just ask him to like redo what he just said to me a minute ago as we warmed up about what, what our uh, what our intention is for today. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing that uh, what I see is a lot of people in couples and it's an odd thing is that when uh, I guess I find I find it inter- odd. I find it. It's, it seems like a dynamic that uh, wouldn't happen. But what happens a lot of times is when we have a couple, one of them gets sober. Uh, and and the other one, you know, is maybe you know is, is normal. Doesn't need to get sober. You know, there. Uh, what happens a lot of times is uh, I see these couples break up. That seems to be something that 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 I see more times than than, than ever. You, you I, my heart wants to say that that would draw two people closer together. My experience is it actually doesn't. Uh, more times than not, it ends up being. I would say one of the things is is that. Uh, when a couple gets together and one of them is using, they're actually under that control of that parasite of the disease, you know, and they're not really who they are. And as a couple comes together, they have come together under some false pretenses. And mm-hmm. when the part, when the one person gets sober, uh, they change so drastically that they're not even the same person. So it can be a back and forth, like like the sick person no longer like likes the person that they picked because they're they're so different that this is not their kind of person anymore, and vice versa. Uh, another dynamic I see in the couples is uh, is that we have this codependency thing, right? And uh, I've seen this happen where. Um, the, let's just I will, I will use it for my frame of reference as a male the guy is uh needs fixing and kind of there's a universal thing about gals grabbing dudes and thinking they can polish this guy up and make him their prince charming that is the archetypal story of like the prince frog mm-hmm. thing of kissing the frog and turning it into a prince uh beauty and the beast it's the same thing and then when he gets fixed so to speak and is no longer a project then like she's bored with him now You know, there's nothing, and there's a little bit of like resentment because she's been trying to fix him and can't, and he comes into a 12-step program and gets well, and she didn't really have anything to do with it. Uh, There's a a lot of odd dynamics go around Mm -hmm. about people getting uh, people getting well through the through the 12 steps or I guess probably more than that that's just where my experience lies. So, uh, welcome to the show, Nick and Mindy. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, excited about having this little chat today uh obviously relationships and this thing is a well i would joke around that we say resentment's the number one offender right that's what our book says but i joke around and say actually i think it's relationships is the number one offender <laughs> uh and, and the fact of the matter is is i of myself i'm okay i really don't have too much problem it's when these other people come into my life and want to stir my shit up is where i start having problems you know <laughs> if i can just stay in my little hidey hole and everybody will just pet dan and be good to him <laughs> uh then then i'm okay it's when we have to when i have opportunities to interact with other humans is when i end up 
uh, and and when I say that uh, relationships is the number one offender, it's really the resentments that come from a relationship because of the um, unhealthy things we do <laughs> when we're when we're sick. So I'm going to invite Nick first off to say what he said after uh, why what brought this to mind to you and what what was the catalyst that that made you say, hey Dan, why don't we do this? Well, a few months ago when I shared my story on here, and uh, I had a great time doing it, but I, on the ride home I started thinking about that I might have glazed over a little bit the amount of insanity, amount of insanity and the amount of madness that I put Mindy through in the years that I was using. We've been together almost 12 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so coming up. you remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like when I asked somebody at the beginning for their sobriety date, I yeah. learned that I need to tip them off about that to begin with so that when they get there, they know it. <laughs> right. Uh, so, th which actually leads me to say that this year's um, when I turn when I have six years of sobriety, it's going to be a pretty big day because that'll be that'll be the turning point of me having as many sober years with Mindy as I had madness years. Oh yeah. But anyway, on the way home from recording my story, I thought, you know what? I just didn't really do a good enough job describing the insanity I put her through, and she doesn't really have any of the isms, and she doesn't. She's not really a codependent person. She doesn't. She's a relatively normal person, and I put her through a lot. And uh, and I, as I thought and sat with that more, thought we we have a really good story to talk about um, after after the sobriety day and h how how our relationship is now compared to the past. And I just thought that might be something to to share to give some hope to some of the people out there that are maybe have spouses that are early in recovery or they're early in recovery and wondering what the, the future holds for their relationship. Um, maybe our story could kind of shed some light. Yeah, I uh, I certainly believe that uh, that that. Well, I, I personally want to explore different angles and what we can do here on the mics as far as sharing things that would help other people. And obviously, uh, relationships are uh, huge. I mean, we have our our circle, and there's a real good in our tribe. A real big piece of what people are coming in to vent about are their relationships with their significant others <laughs> but mm -hmm. the, the, a, a good percentage is that and it, it runs the gamut and some of that is not necessarily bad stuff it's something we just do because that's a way where we we that's a way we can discharge that negative energy on safe people is what i you know and so that way we Get come in there, there it's not yeah it's not it's not necessarily means that these uh relationships are in crisis or anything so anybody out there that might be listening don't because I, I know if i was listening i go they're talking about me <laughs> <laughs> uh, but fact of the matter is it is uh it is huge in in our recovery our, our relationships and and uh specifically with our, our intimate relationships with significant others and it just it's 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 certainly worth some time absolutely yeah um so where do you want to start or where do you want to go from here well um i i guess maybe just to kind of give a a brief overview of the madness as I see it in our relationship. And then um, I'm sure Mindy would love to correct me where I stray from the path <laughs> there. But um, when, when we met, I was firmly in the madness. Um, I did a good job of keeping the quantity maybe of alcohol that I drank um, out of her purview. But I was, I was drinking heavily. Our, our first few dates revolved. I mean, we, we hung out in a bar and she, you know, I don't think she it was normal at the time for her she's a, a girl in her 20s and that's kind of what you do she didn't have a problem so it was normal to her but sure it'd be completely normal to say let's go have a drink yeah well, and we also nick and i met working at a restaurant together so in the restaurant business it's kind of normal that after your shift is over everybody goes out and gets drinks you yeah. know and hangs out and it's so you know, it was just, natural. yeah, it was just natural. Yeah. I, I didn't think anything was weird or off about it. So it was just kind of what we did. You know, the first few times we hung out, we got together after work and went out with people to bars and stuff. And that's just what we did. Yeah. And what she didn't know is that the, the drink after the shift wasn't my first of the day, you know, so I, I'd, been, I'd been <laughs> drinking all day, right. but all of a sudden it's okay to be drinking. So, but um, our relationship kind of uh, blossomed really quickly. Uh, we, we moved in together um, within the first year of dating. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I, I knew from the beginning that I had met my soulmate. I just had, you know, 10 yards of 
madness piled on top of that that knowledge that was getting in the way so we moved in together uh it was it was rocky and at the time i would tell you that you know i maybe would say that it was half my fault and half hers but in reality it was 99 percent my fault the, the madness once i once somebody's living with me the i can't hide that madness very well anymore so i don't even think we lasted living together for a full year no i mean we i think we moved in together in november and i think you moved out in april yeah um that was one of the that was the first time we broke up and i you know i moved back over to my cave of a bachelor pad where my buddy still lived and went back to not being messed with about my madness yeah so you had a place to go back to fall back to like oh yeah always interesting yeah and and some of my buddies still live in that house really yeah 12 years later yeah yeah and it's it's now i go back there and it turns my stomach it's nasty yeah but uh and i don't know that they're necessarily addicts or alcoholics but they were okay with me being one and that's all i needed but anyway so yeah we broke up quickly uh and you know we just never neither one of us could ever give up Mm -mm. (laughs) and this is where i kind of i don't i really don't think that mindy is your typical codependent i just think that for whatever reason she saw something that she wasn't willing to give up on so we would get back together and then inevitably my madness would creep back in um yeah when when nick and i broke up the first time (laughs) um I, you know, when I broke up with him, I didn't want to break up with him. You know, I didn't want us, I didn't want him to move out, but it was like, it had to happen. You know, he was not healthy and, you know, add bills and rent and stuff like that on top of it. And it's even worse because this unhealthy person can't participate equally in all of that. And so, you know, we had to break up and it, broke my heart that we had to do that but it was it was what had to happen at the time were there ultimatums involved or anything like uh if you you, if you don't start or you know if you can't do this then you need to go or uh was it just a thing that just crumbled it kind of just crumbled i mean he you know at that time we were so i had a full-time job he was working at the restaurant still um i was working at the restaurant part-time and you know, if Nick Nick would come home on like a Tuesday and he would just be hammered and he didn't think that there was anything wrong with that, <laughs> yeah, right, you know, yeah. I mean, he'd come home from work and I'm like, how many beers did you have? Oh, just one. I'm like, no, you didn't, uh, you know. Um, and so, I mean, we had some conversations like about rent and about bills and it would just never, it would go from having a conversation to kind of exploding. And so um, there weren't really any ultimatums, but I feel like it just... You know what I mean? I mean, a lot of times there's a, if you don't get your shit together, you know, yeah, uh, that, that kind of stuff, you know, and that time, but sometimes it's just a degradation thing of just the friction of the, of somebody, of the, of the unhealthy aura mm-hmm. in, in between causes enough friction that it just can't. Yeah. I would say it was more that we, it was just like two, the two wrong ends of magnets, you know, they're just will not. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I guess I was probably looking for more stability in him and he just couldn't offer that to me at the time. You know, his head just, that's not where he was at. And so So did you parachute out or did you tell her, did you tell him he needed to go? I told him he needed to go and it was rough. I mean, the day he moved out, I was just bawling. I was so sad, you know, and eventually I had to move out of that house too because I couldn't afford the rent on my own. It makes me teary-eyed now even thinking Mm -hmm. about it. Um, And I was just so sad, you know, because it's not at all what I wanted to happen, but it just wasn't, it wasn't healthy at the time. So, you know, as Nick said, we kind of always went back to each other. and And I remember after he moved out and we broke up and I just felt like, I had this weird feeling about him like like I was meant to be with him but it just wasn't the right time hmm. and I think that's part of the reason why I I've always been drawn to him is because I just knew like I know I'm supposed to be with this person but it just is not working right now 
And so I think, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how you feel about that, but I feel like for me, that's why we always kind of got back together. You know, we just couldn't stay very far apart from each other. Yeah, I I would try to, because I have a pragmatic brain, even in the madness I did, I tried to build up reasons why it was better this way to be broken up. And I could never convince myself that it was better to be without, without her. I just never, it never made sense to me. And, uh, I I was, I was in pain too. I wasn't in enough pain for whatever reason to override the madness. So, I mean, of course we move out and I, my intake ups exponentially. Um, you were, you were probably making some attempt to manage at least at a level of camouflaging it. Yes. There were nothing else. It wasn't necessarily that I was trying to manage my use. It was just trying to like, not look like I'm using a lot. Right. (laughs) And, and then, at that time, I mean, when like when we lived together towards the end, I had no idea how much he was drinking or I don't think you were, I mean, you were smoking back then, but, mm-hmm. you know, I had no idea the quantity of, of what it was. Right. Um, yeah, that was always my plan. You know, I'm going to let you see that I'm doing it because it's insane to like pretend like I'm not at all. That would be, right. you know, that's not going to work, but I'm definitely going to only show you mm-hmm. the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah, two beers. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> you know <laughs> I could drink two beers for like all day. Yeah, because the cans are always the same color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and then that that was definitely my trick, but yeah. So I mean, I you know, all of a sudden I'm in a position where I don't have to hide anymore. So you know, the, yep, it, gloves come off. Yeah, gloves come off. Um, it wasn't too long. I would say maybe maybe less than a couple months before um, we crashed into each other again Mm -hmm. um i had i I had started seeing someone and mindy got word of it and she she (laughs) she, this girl is uh fierce when she wants to be and she marched right over my house knocked on the door and said what the fuck are you doing Uh, those (laughs) words exactly (laughs) and uh you know, like so. Why, just you know, then that's probably sideline kind of stuff, and probably I don't know how much uh, bearing it would have. But we'll, if you're broke up, why? I think for me, it just hurt that we broke up and he moved on so quickly. So quickly, okay. yes. You know, and so I didn't know maybe if it was a person like that, maybe it was a friend of yours, or no, it was no, somebody no. that, or it was if it was somebody that, that you knew was really bad for him, or well, there's well, that, there's for that. Sure. but <laughs> there's it was that a, sure. it was someone that worked at the restaurant. I didn't know her personally. I knew of her, but um, so that's think, a real interesting dynamic to you know to think that you get to march in and ask your ex boyfriend, yeah, I mean, doing dating somebody, you know, yeah, <laughs> so, I don't, hold on, we are broke up. <laughs> Well, the thing is, on, on a, for a variety of reasons. So, she was right. It was bad for yeah. me. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying she was wrong. <laughs> this 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 girl was definitely an untreated alcoholic. Um, so it it let me keep the gloves off. Didn't sure, have to yeah. hide anything around her. Yeah. Um, but then the other thing to have her, I, just because I was carrying on with this girl did not mean I was over Mindy and right. and women. I think often women think that it has nothing to do with it. It's just something to treat the pain. Yeah. Really. Um, so when she marched up to my front door and knocked on and came in and, you know, swung around at me, I like that. I felt a lot of love out of that. Mm-hmm. I felt I, I, I felt like she was fighting for me. And so that appealed to me. And so of, of course I stopped what I was doing and said, okay, you know, if that's, if that's what you want, that's that's the deal. Well, and I think too, part of my like anger towards it was we broke up because we had to, not because we wanted to, you know? And I think that's why it made me so mad that he moved on quickly was because I didn't want that, but it's what had to happen, you know? So it hurt even more like that he was moving on when I knew that wasn't what either of us wanted. So, you know, and I'm, well, and, and, she, I, she and my jealous streak definitely came out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so. she didn't move on at all. You know, I mean, she, you know, I, I think you might have like had some like friendly uh, times. You know, like you hung out with a person, but you didn't. Um, you, you were you weren't you weren't going. I didn't what Nick? You didn't have sex <laughs> with anybody. How about that? I'll just put it out there. You did. You didn't do that. And uh, so yeah, but so yeah, that when she marched into the house and and said that, I you know, like okay. Yeah, all right. 
Um, we didn't move back in with each other at that time, though. Mm -hmm. um, we just started dating again. Um, shortly thereafter is when I had the situation which um, Mindy wanted to correct, I think, correct my version of that story of when I had to go into the hospital. Um, I, I had gotten really drunk after... Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember exactly what led up to that really bad drunk, but um, got to the point. You got into a fight with your dad. Yeah, I, not a physical fight, but a, a words verbal fight, fight, verbal over fight over politics. I think. And he was. decided he didn't want me to work with him that day. Um, but anyway, that was uh, probably my first real attempt at getting sober because I agreed to go to the treatment center in in Indianapolis. Um, what I had left out in the story before when I told my story that she reminded me of is that I was actually threatening to hurt myself that day oh, were as well. You? Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah. And so that's why they locked me up in the, on the loony floor, not just the addiction floor of the, of the hospital. I took my shoelaces away. Yeah. That's a real quick way to get attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Not I, quite the attention I want, but yeah, you start talking about hurting yourself or somebody else. Yeah. You're going to be involuntarily yeah. hitched up. And so, I can kind of see how uh, I could be real liable to leave some of that out of my house as I'm flowing along. And it's not like I'm hiding it or whatever. But there is just a, I have a fundamental thing in me that doesn't want to look at some of like when I have those kind of feelings. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we talk and do these stories, though, I mean, even though we're going like two hours plus sometimes, it's phenomenal what we still leave out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not on purpose. No, it's not. It's just there's, I mean, golly, I guess I honestly, if you were going to sit here, you would almost need to be a. You know, we all got pretty, especially if we're, you know, I wouldn't say everybody, but uh, we have pretty big stories if you wanted to, like, delve deeper. So, mm -hmm. heck, you could go, like, two parts, three parts, you know, yeah. uh, keep on going. So, anyway, uh, you all started dating again. And you went in and checked yourself. or you ended up getting, probably Did like you check month. yourself or did you, they actually take you? I checked myself in. I, she, well, we took you. Yeah. I mean, she. I agreed to go. It was, it was not. Nobody came. And it wasn't like me. Baker acted is what you'd say no. now of where they yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. You're. Uh, I voluntarily mm -hmm. went. Um, I had I had gotten so mad and drunk that day that I had punched a archway in, in the house that I was living in and just disintegrated a couple of knuckles. So I was in pain. Yeah. I, I was, I mean, I can't remember. Maybe the guilt, remembers. shame, and remorse running heavy. Yeah. I can't remember what my blood alcohol was when they got to the hospital, but I remember it being like astronomical. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And I, I was there for what, three or four days? Yeah. Three or four days. And, uh, you know, I always say that my first AA meeting was the one that I met with, um, met Smitty at at the token club i actually did in the treatment center have to go to a meeting it was an aa meeting if i recall correctly hmm. um but so somebody brought a meeting into the facility that y'all were yeah yeah um <sighs> but anyway after like three days in there i wanted out badly um <laughs> badly and i told the doctor that i realized what i needed to do i needed to not drink and that i could do that and so i connived my way out of it uh, you know, I, I told them all the things they wanted to hear. I don't, yeah. I don't know why I said I wanted to hurt myself. I was drunk. I don't want to hurt myself. And you know, the, and their side of it is they really are at some powerless in the things too. And maybe they're sitting there listening to you, going, "This guy's completely full of shit," but mm -hmm. they really can't do anything but let you out. And you are bound and determined with all of your gibberish about why you need to leave. They're going. And he was no longer on see you suicide later. watch at that point. So yeah, you know they have they can't really they couldn't really hold him yeah you can't there. hold somebody you mm -hmm. can't i didn't even know that at the time i thought i had to talk my way out of it so yeah, I, was right, being, yeah. I was doing a really good job of being a salesman i didn't know all i had to do but you know now if i hear I somebody leave. giving me all those kind of excuses and stuff yeah. you know, the more you're telling me the more i know you're full of shit right <laughs> i didn't know i could just walk in there and be like hey i'm leaving yeah. <laughs> you know but apparently i could have um so yeah but that that started um the period of time where i did go a year and a half or more without drinking. I think it was, over, I think it was over two years altogether. Yeah. Now I smoked weed and did other things during that time. And I, and I, you know, if you, if you don't know about that period in my life, you can go back to my story. But I, um, but I did smoke weed and stuff and, and we were, we got back together and we were actually having a pretty good time then because I wasn't drinking. I was just smoking weed. Um, of course, I didn't know how much at the yeah, time. Of course, but. I mean, I, I was still actively in the madness. I just switched 
the chemical, you know, yeah. of, of squeezing on the on marijuana. Yep. Um, and you know, uh, my, it's my opinion. Uh, yeah, uh, marijuana does not put the wall up that drinking does. Drinking is a complete, you know, not to seem better. Not uh, for an alcoholic, but the wall is not quite as thick and solid and blurry and as what it is on when you're just smoking dope. And, and the madness isn't as manic. Yeah. When you're just on weed, you know, you... I heard Jordan Peterson the other day say, and I don't know if this is true, but I certainly relate to it, that alcohol is the only drug that makes people aggressive. Uh, We don't usually get mean and mad on pot. Uh, I think cocaine Uh, made me aggressive. Yeah, you know, we we had this conversation last night, too. How many times did you do cocaine and aren't drinking? None. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, that's exactly... One time. One time. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) we could always find that anomaly out there, you know. uh, Like the time that I actually managed to drink three beers and stop. It was like in 1982. (laughs) It was on a Saturday night. And uh, and Uh, I got the Maybe when I was 14. I got bronchitis that night and I couldn't breathe. So I only drank three. But that's the same thing we did last night around over at Chase's house. And that's what people go, no, cocaine? How many times? And everybody's like... Yeah, I don't remember yeah. doing cocaine, not drinking. <laughs> cocaine and alcohol will make you very aggressive. <laughs> but um, yeah, so after that, we uh, we're, we were doing pretty good. But uh, I got that opportunity to go uh, grow a bunch of weed in Michigan, and so I just I I build it to Mindy as I need to go get healthy, and this is how I'm going to do it. And I basically broke up with her. Yeah, in, in good times, I broke up with her and ran up there and did that. Go do some organic farming. Yeah, to do some organic farming. and Yeah, he kind of pitched it as, I need to go clear my head, be by myself for a while, you know. Cool, clear air, uh-huh. bright skies. <laughs> yeah. Smoke an ounce of weed a day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's basically what I was doing. And uh, again, you know, like, I think I'd been up there for three or four months, and we hadn't really talked all that much occasionally, but... Actually, I don't think we talked occasionally. I think no, was, we really you, didn't. You were, I think you were pretty hurt that I was able to walk away that quick. And I, I wasn't seeing anybody else. I really was just living in a cabin in a place that's only busy in the summer, so I didn't see anybody. Um, I, I was living a pretty solitary deal, just working in the barn on weed, fishing, and snowmobiling. That's like what I said in the beginning. You know, when it's just me by myself, I'm I'm, I'm pretty yeah. good no matter really what I'm doing. If yeah. nobody gets in my way. Happy day. <laughs> and, and, and I and I had all these things that made me feel so much better. Like there was alcohol in this cabin because my buddy's family owned it. And uh, they, you know, they, they were normal people. They had they had booze there and I didn't drink any of it. And I thought, man, look at me. Yeah. But anyway, um, again, Mindy, um, just the, the little firecracker that she is. She got, it was about three or four months of this and she just called me out of the blue and she just said she wasn't accepting this. Truth be told. Okay, here we go. I was in Las Vegas at the time. I was not completely sober when I reached out to Nick. But something happened in Vegas. I don't even remember what it was. And it just reminded me of him. And so I reached out to him. And it was kind of out of the blue. I mean, Nick responded like, is this for real? Like, are you really trying to talk to me right now? And I was like, yeah, you know, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. But that's that's kind of how that kicked up again was... I was not completely sober when I reached out to him. (laughs) But, yeah, so, you know, I just kind of reached out to him again to see how he was doing. And he was doing his thing up north. And, you know, we kind of decided to get together and see each other again. And so I went to go visit him. And um, and it it was good. I will have to say it was good when I went to visit him because he wasn't drinking. And I could tell the difference you know yes was he smoking quite a bit of course did i know how much no or what other things he was doing but as far as the alcohol you could you could there was a noticeable difference in just his demeanor you know and so um you know we had good conversations and it was really great to see each other again and then we just kind of from there just started talking again um and i'd go visit him when i could and um you know he'd come to indy when he could and we'd see each other and that's just kind of how it kicked up again like like i said there was always just something that always kind of brought us back together and or brought me back to him was just i just had this always had this feeling in my heart like i know i'm supposed to be with this person we just have to figure it out kind of thing 
and um and it was different from anybody else I had ever dated b- before. It was just a totally different feeling. You know, I'd broken up with long-term boyfriends, and obviously I was sad about those. But when I, when Nick and I would break up, it was, it was just a whole different ball game. You know, it was, I was just a wreck because I just knew, like, this is not how this is supposed to be kind of thing. And I don't know why I thought that or how or what or you know a higher power was trying to tell me something but I just that's how I always felt with him so I (laughs) I, I'm going off on a tangent but no um, that's good yeah so we started talking again and yeah and it it led me to I mean I have I have a lot of things to be thankful to Mindy for but one thing in this time period is that that reuniting, that rekindling of the flame led me to move back to Indy and go to culinary school and use the money that I had made up there doing the organic farming um, to do that. And shortly after I left, that organic farming operation was raided and I was saved the the legal ramifications yeah, of that because I was gone. I mean, it was like two months later. Well, and I think, you know, when when during that time you were living up there and the thing that I saw in Nick is he's a very intelligent person you know he is constantly reading he's very smart he's an amazing at that time you know just amazing cook I mean he's got lots of talents he's he can do things with his hands all of these different things and he was living up there and I'm like is this really what you want to do for the rest of your life you know it's like do you just want to is this it? You want to be by yourself for the rest of your life and not put to use any of these great talents that you have. And I think that kind of got in his brain. I mean, it wasn't an ultimatum or anything. It was just like, like, is this what you want to do? And I think that got in his brain a little bit and he realized he, that isn't, that wasn't what he wanted to do. Yeah. So, and it, she's right in it. But yeah, I I used that money and turned it into a, a, you know, culinary school and, Shortly after starting the culinary school in India is when she got the nod that she was going to be promoted from her job to the Louisville market. Hmm. And so she was moving down here. Um, at first, you know, we, we stayed together, um, but I didn't move right away. Yeah, Just, I mean, I moved down here with, I didn't expect Nick to follow. You know, I was just like, this is something I need to do for myself. I can't pass up this opportunity. I'm moving and we'll just kind of see if it works out or if it doesn't for as far as us as a couple so and i didn't last but two months Mm -hmm. and said i want to move down here with you and and at point that point i'm still not drinking still smoking a ton of weed though um when i left the operation i took half my oh not half maybe 25 percent of my payment for the year in 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 weed weed. (laughs) so i had like a big a big tote in my closet (laughs) you know but uh yeah, so moved moved down here, transferred schools to Sullivan, so I could finish my culinary degree down here, and uh, we got a little apartment together. And I started working in the restaurants down here. Mm-hmm. Um, that led me back to the drinking, though, because there came a point in my culinary progression where I started letting these crazy lies in, um, especially when I got into working in fine dining restaurants. Like I'm cooking all this awesome food that pairs with wine. I need to be able to taste the wine with my food and started selling that lie to her and started selling that lie to my, my family. And eventually one day convinced me and I don't know how much I convinced everybody else, but I convinced myself that it was okay. And I had, you know, some things that you've probably heard before. I I went, uh, almost two years without a drink. I've got willpower. Mm. I don't have not a problem. A yeah, I don't have a problem. If I had a problem, you would never do that. Right. Who who would be able to do that if they're an alcoholic? I and, get that. And, you know, the, and the, at I'd the time. I'd do that after five days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I mean, at the time, Mindy. Two years. And this is what I really want us to eventually get into talking about is she didn't know anything about AA or truly about alcoholics she didn't she didn't come from a family where there's a bunch of them running around she didn't know she didn't know that that was a lie um she didn't know what to think i'm sure she was gun shy to see me take a drink but Mm -hmm. she didn't know that it was you know lighting a powder keg yeah and he spun it to me as i want to be able to taste 
wine with my food. I, you know, as a chef and in culinary school, I need to be able to pair food with wines. And so I was definitely gun shy. But I remember specifically, we were at Thanksgiving with his family. And Nick said to me in front of all of his family, can I have some wine? And I said, well, can you handle drinking some wine? Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm good. I, I'll, I can control it, blah, blah, blah. But at the time, I didn't realize this. But looking back on it, he wanted to put it on me. Yeah, right. So he didn't have to feel, you know, the... He didn't want to have to feel responsible for making that call, that yeah. decision. So he, that's well, you why know, he. And I'll double throw my view in there. The disease is doing that. It sees that opportunity, and it's like she's not going to tell me straight up no. In yeah, front with of the whole body. family there yeah. looking at and me, you know, like it's not. But I can promise you, you didn't have no conscious thought of that. That's that disease driving us and doing stuff to us. It's like when it's got the joystick named Nick, and it's going. Yeah. 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 Oh, we'll put, you know, we'll have her make the. It's call. interesting those dynamics though, and how that plays out you know and like looking at it from with the glasses i have on today I, that's what it looks like to me you know mm-hmm. uh otherwise it's just a it's just a thing right yeah it's just that's the way it happened <laughs> but, but there's the something ta- underlying there yeah but at the time i didn't you know yeah realize what was going on and so i was like well, and that's like you know and that's like like because like I, that, I look at that as like, that's permission forever, too. That yeah, wasn't oh yeah. just for today. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> this is the new normal now. Yeah, right. I drink again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And I did, and that's exactly what I did. I mean, I was... I, I <laughs> That is so interesting. I don't want... I think it maybe was a couple of weeks before I was back to hiding alcohol places. And, and, I, and I think I did a good job of camouflaging it for a while, um, making her think that sure it, that i was handling it okay but i i can't imagine i hit it very well for too long well at the time too you know i had a full-time job here nick was going to school and working at a fine dining restaurant so we had totally opposite schedules i mean we saw each other very little during the week so i think that also helped his alcoholism because he could hide it you know, we weren't around each other. So he knew when he was going to see me and when he maybe needed to reel it in. And we just, we weren't together a whole lot. So I I really at that time had no idea that it had gone from, you know, having a sip of wine to back into it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know. I just, uh, I you know, I no longer believe in coincidence and stuff. And, and, and it's interesting how that'll, because I have a similar kind of thing happen in, in my marriage. I was married for 17 years, was with uh, her for 25, which my kid's mother. And at some point in time, we started getting on opposite schedules, too. Mm-hmm. So we just passed like ships in the night, as they would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that made it real easy for me oh, to yeah. continue to use at some level that, you know, it, I always uh, had these little episodes that like hyper accelerated my alcoholism, you know, where I, the gloves come off and, and I was able to simultaneously cam- camouflage it yeah. from my closest relationship, which is where I needed to most hide it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's definitely what, what happened. I mean, it, it really accelerated it and, um, I started dabbling in the pills at that point. Um, I didn't really get like, not like towards the end, like daily use, but I definitely started picking that up. Um, so yeah, accelerated my disease. Um, it had a, had an effect on our relationship. I think, I think by that next summer, Mindy was growing tired of it and probably well done. done. Um, and I don't know if you want to pick up here before I go into um, kind of like what led us into marriage? Well, you know, we lived in an apartment then, so we decided to buy our first house. Um, we'd gotten engaged during when we were still in our apartment, so we moved into a house. Um, we'd gotten engaged, so we were starting to plan a wedding, all of that good stuff. Nick was finishing up culinary school. So at the time, for me, you know, like I said, I didn't realize that his drinking had gone from zero to ten at that time um if he would come home and he was like stressed or just irritable i would chalk it up to he was going to school full time he was working full time you know i didn't really think too much of it because i i saw you drink but i never saw it to the extent that it was you know i mean so there was a lot you know it's not like laying back with a bottle you know yeah there he is again you know yeah yeah you know so i 
I was oblivious to a lot of what was going on at the time. Um, and I kind of chalk when Nick would be in a bad mood, I would just chalk it up to there was a lot going on in our lives. We were planning a wedding. We had just moved into a new house. He was in school, you know, yada, yada, yada. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I think is is accommodating and is loving and all of those i mean all these words i can use to describe how she has always been for some reason i always used our relationship as an excuse for my madness um it wasn't until i got sober that i started realizing <clears throat> how how wrong I, that that idea was um because and by that meaning like she, she's always been she's always I mean, been like great the, to me yeah but the excuse the the lie you were telling yourself oh like i i need this drink because of you know, she doesn't understand me, and I work, and I go to school, and she doesn't understand the pressure that I'm under. Yeah. Um, I just wanted you to elaborate on yeah. that a little mm-hmm. bit. And I would make situations that weren't about me all about me. I mean, of course. What, when we were in this period of our life, we got pregnant, and we had a miscarriage, and I was incredibly selfish about that. I don't feel like I was there for her at all. I think when I got the call that she had a miscarriage, the first thing I did was buy pills. Hmm. and maybe even stop for a six-pack on the way home. Like, I need to make sure that my head feels good before I even get to her head, the one that's body is affected. Um, those, These are the situations that stick out in me of the insanity I put her through, is um, everything that comes across my desk is about me. If, if, it's, if it's in my orbit, even if it happens to her, if it's in my orbit, it happened to me. And that, that's definitely one of the situations that, that was like that to, to me. Yeah, I, I mean, there just during that time, there wasn't really a lot of support from him on that. It was kind of like, okay, this happened. You need to get over it. You know, like, it's no big deal. Just move on. And We'll try again. Yeah, and it was the sadness and the loss that comes with it wasn't really even, you know, it, you just didn't even really look at it. You know, you didn't look at it as a, as a loss. You just kind of looked at it as, okay, this happened, move on. You didn't want to be pregnant when we were, mar- we were getting married anyway, right? You yeah. Know, stuff I mean, like that. I mean, just uh, what I think today You're not going to fit in that terrible. wedding dress very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, things that today, like, are just so against my nature to even think, let alone say, I said. Yeah. Um, and didn't, I mean, I don't, I don't think I was trying to hurt anybody. Right. It was just... The way I was navigating my my disease at that time, yeah, and it was hard for me too because, you know, as that he's my partner and we had gone through this loss together, and I felt like I should be able to talk to him about it, but it was like, nope, you know, you just need to move on, and that was really hard for me not having you know the, the person that I'm going through this with to talk to about it, and then it made me feel like. Well, maybe I do just need to get over this. You know, maybe I am. Am I overreacting here? Yeah, am I overreacting? Do I need to, you know, and it made me look at myself like, oh. Well, that's a really big thing what alcoholics do. We make other people begin to question their own sanity. They Mm -hmm. begin to begin to think, you know, am I the crazy one? And I think that's where definitely, I think that's where, and we can kind of get into it a little bit more, but that's definitely where it's, that was the first time of me feeling like, of his disease making me feel like, Maybe I am a little, you know, crazy. Maybe I need to get over this, you know, and really kind of putting it back on me. I'd say that was probably the first time I felt that way. And I definitely do want you to, um, it may maybe take some time to describe that. Like, because I know that you questioned your own reality a lot when I would say, no, I haven't been drinking or, you know, yeah, I, I know I took $40 out of the ATM three times today, but that was for these other reasons, not... <clears throat> Um, I, I, maybe I guess I want you to describe some of the that. Well, um, you know, I feel like after we moved into our house and Nick finished up school, we um, we got married. I feel like after we got married is when his disease went full force. It's like he had to get past us getting married. And then he'd be like, ah, you know, like now I can just. I've got the wife, I've got the house, I've got this. Now I can just, you know, not consciously doing this, obviously, but his disease was just like, okay, now we can do our thing. Yeah, we have we've, these things secured every, now. Yeah, we've checked you know, all these all things off down our and list. Down. 
Um, I have another theory real quick. Sorry to interrupt. But my theory or what I feel like happened is I always had these benchmarks built into mm -hmm. my disease. When I graduate from culinary school, I won't drink as much because I'll feel better about myself. When I own a house, I won't drink as much. When I get married and every time you hit one of those benchmarks and you don't feel better about yourself, yeah. that's, that's the worst. It is the absolute... Ter most terrible place to be because then you sit there and you're like well what will make me feel better and so I don't think it was so much of I got you now you can't kick me out <laughs> as much as it was like just utter desperation because I had gotten everything that I wanted and I still didn't feel better mm -hmm. yeah we have this like you know way uh, just it's exactly the same thing because all three of these things are right you know uh, that that I just thought that inherently, when I achieved a certain thing, that that would that, that that I would start managing this other thing better. Yeah, you know, no matter what it was, when I have kids, when I, you know, that will force me, right, to start dealing because with we this. Have this. We have this, and it was just like we happen, good, right? And it's also that it's just going to happen. You know, yeah. like it's just going to by osmosis or some kind of thing, the universe is going to come down and tap me on the head with a sword and relieve me of this burden that I feel like I'm carrying. Yeah. When, uh, when, you know, uh, the, obviously that never happens for any of us, but we have that 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 goal in mind or that that milestone that that that'll, that it will just inherently happen. Yeah, I think, and, and I'll let you continue because I think that's really what that to me that's what launched the darkest part of my journey well and i i agree with that because i'm i think it's probably a combination of the two really is you know you were looking for that next thing to kind of fix make you feel better and it wasn't happening and so yeah i think you're right like it, it then pushed your alcoholism and your disease even further um but i mean i remember times back then you know after we had gotten married and like i said all these boxes were checked where nick would just be he would just be down and out, you know, and nothing could pick him up. I I mean, it could be a beautiful, sunny day outside. And I remember specifically times saying that to him, like, look outside, you know, it's gorgeous outside. Be happy that's a sunny day. Like, just, he just, you couldn't, it's like you couldn't turn off the, the doom and gloom at that time. And for me, as someone who's typically a pretty happy person, um, that was hard you know i'm like what is the deal like we've got a good life we've got all these things going for us like you know and obviously that's me not understanding his disease at the time but it was it was tough just realizing like what is it going to take for this guy to be happy you know and um it's kind of makes me think of that, you know, that sunny day and and not be able to you know that's like the epitome of blocking the sunlight and the yeah. spirit oh. Thing, you know oh, absolutely. we are blocked I mean, the and, good and, can't get in. And I, I worked, you know, because of the fine dining, you know, working the dinner shift. I basically worked second shift, so I slept most of the day away. I at the time I would have told you that I liked night better. I mean, I, I just, I'm just a night owl. Yeah, I just did everything to turn myself into I'm a not a motoring guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and yeah, and so you know, after we got married, Nick got this job that he had really, really wanted at a fine dining restaurant. Um, which was great. We were both really happy about it. And, but again, we were on completely opposite schedules. Um, you know, I think we saw each other maybe four hours a week at that point. Yeah. If that, I would, you know, he'd get home at two in the morning. I'd be asleep so he could kind of do his thing. And I'd get up at nine in the morning and, or, you know, eight or whatever and go to work. So we were just, like you said, two ships just passing in the night. We didn't really see each other, and um, I think that catapulted things mm -hmm. even more. Um, I did start to pick up on his drinking more just because he would, I mean, it'd be like a random day of the week, and I'd come home from work at 4 o'clock, and he would just be, if it was his day off, he would just be hammered, you know, and I'd be like, what did you drink? Oh, two beers again. Yeah. I just had a couple just beers. A couple I'm like, beers honey. And he's like slurring his words. I'm like, no, you know, are you sure you didn't take anything? You know, yada Just kind of tired. Yeah. And at this point, I'm fully in the throes of opiate addiction. You know, I, this at this point, I'm 
I'm taking a lot of pills in a day, so that's. I mean, yes, I was drinking more than two beers, but I also had opiates. Well, and at you know at that time, I was starting to pick up on his drinking, so I was you know looking at our bank account and monitoring our bank account, seeing where all the money was going and everything. And because I was more, you know, I was more curious about his drinking. I think that escalated his pill usage because he thought. Well, if I'm not drinking, she, you know, if I, I take, did that. Yeah, if I take pills, she's not going to smell the alcohol mm. on me. I started to put that same balancing game of, of tipping over and taking more opiates, more pain pills, and drinking less. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I would look at our bank account and I would see like these twenty dollar withdrawals, and I'd be like, "What? What is this for?" Oh, well, at the restaurant, they needed me to go pick up lettuce, or I don't know, you know, whatever the item was. So I had to take cash out to go get that. And I'm like, and it'd be like four times in a day, yeah, right. you know, but it was always, oh, I needed to go and, do this. And the work. restaurant needs you to use your own money. To yeah. Do and this? I'm like, right. and that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, you know, baby. Are they paying you back? Yeah. Yeah. They're paying me back. Obviously that was not happening. Um, you know, so I was starting to kind of, I was picking up on things a lot more. I remember at the time, like just having at that time, I had a pit in my stomach just all the time about Nick, like. I was nervous to leave him because I thought, well, what's he going to do, you know, while I'm gone? And it just, it was a tough time. Mm-hmm. And um, financially, it was tough for us because he was using our money for drugs or alcohol, but spending it to me totally different, you know. Um, and so we were... We were fighting a bit about that because I'm like, well, where's all this money going? You know, you've got a, you got a promotion and like, it's just like, where's our money going? And, you know, so it was starting to get tough and um, I don't know. Where do you want to go? Well, I, I think this kind of leads us to like the last couple of throws of the disease. But the thing, you know, we, we say a lot, um, we don't regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. And I can say for the majority of my past, I feel that way. But there's a couple of situations that stick out that are just really hard for me to look at and not still feel that guilt, shame, and remorse about and regret. And one that um, probably the worst, one of the worst ones is her 30th birthday. Mm. Her 30th birthday. um, And I'm not a birthday person. Like I don't. You don't have birthdays? (laughs) I don't make a big deal about my birthday. Like it's, you know. It's a day on the calendar kind of thing. Like we just, we don't make it a big deal usually. But she's such a good person and such a good friend that like she's got all these friends that just want to do good stuff for her. And for her 30th birthday, they wanted to make a big deal. And I think that they probably knew that I wasn't going to do shit for it because I couldn't, you know, I could barely get myself dressed. Um, So they, they got uh, a cabin on Lake Ohio, on like on the Ohio river for us and, a bunch of our friends to get together. My brothers for, were there. Your brothers were there. A um, bunch of friends. You know, we had some canoes on the river. We had a hot tub. I mean, it, it was a nice, nice deal. And just so happens that one of her friends that was coming was doing the. She wanted to clean out her bar, so she just brought like a couple boxes of bottles of booze to this party, and you know, not necessarily for everybody to drink there, but just to take with them. She didn't want them. Um, I wanted them. You know, and I had also brought a pocket Yeehaw. full of pills. Yeah. So it's, you know, Saturday morning. Uh, her friends and brothers are all out, like, fishing and hanging out and stuff. And I'm cozying up to which one of these 20 bottles am I drinking first kind of thing. And uh, man, it was an ugly, ugly day. Yeah. I remember I came back in from canoeing, and it was maybe, like, 1130. You know, and people were starting to have drinks and cocktails and stuff like that and nick was literally slurring his words and i'm like what did you take what you know it's noon and you can barely function right now and you know the embarrassment started to set in because my brothers are there you know um my our very close friends are there and i'm like get it together like this is what are you doing you know and oh nothing i just I just had too much to drink. I just had too much to drink. And I'm like, it's noon. How have you already had too much to drink? You know? And um, that night, our friends had planned for us to have this, like, really nice steak dinner. And Nick was going to cook everything. Yeah. And, um, 
and Nick ended up falling down a hill almost into the Ohio River. Luckily, he did not. Busted his face, busted his arms, legs. I mean, hurt himself pretty good, you know. And I remember a friend coming, one of our good friends came in and she's like, Mindy, he's hurt. You need to go see him. And I was like, nope. (laughs) I said, I'm not dealing with it. Like, this is my birthday. I'm here with the people I love the most in the world. Like, no, he's a hot mess. I'm not dealing with it. And everyone kind of was like, whoa. But I had been dealing with this stuff personally at our house for months on end now. And I was just like, no, this is. I'm not doing this tonight. And my friends came in to talk to me and they're like, are you okay? And I was like, no, he's got a problem. Like he really has a problem and I just, I can't deal with it. And so, you know, Nick finally came by this time, the dinner he was supposed to cook for all of us was over. We had all figured it out. They had done birthday cake for me. Nick wasn't there. You know, all of this stuff had gone down And so finally Nick comes up and he's bloody and his face is all messed up. And I'm just like, I just didn't even want to talk to him. You know, I just, I just couldn't deal with it. And um, I remember we went to bed that night and I was again, like, what did you take? I know it wasn't just alcohol to make you act this way. What if nothing, nothing, nothing. I was just, I just drank too much. I just drank too much, you know? Little did I know he had a pocket full of pills he had also taken that day, which, of course, was intensifying everything. But isn't it some, you know, so I hear, you know, it is interesting that if it, if long as it is just alcohol, then we're all right. Well, and I know it's not that. You know what I mean? It's not. But that's kind of like, it's just, I'm just too drunk. Yeah. Oh, well, Mm -hmm. you know, but you're and you're going, no, there's something else more than that. Yeah, you know, and, and the, so, the, so the fact that you're just a sh- you, because know, you, you, you we know we could do the same thing without the pills, right? I can oh, get yeah. just as bad oh, without yeah. them. But yeah. the, that that goes to the normalization of the drinking, right? Right. In society, that you know, it's like, well, that's a, I can, we can, we can live with that. Right. <laughs> what I else just, are you doing? Yeah, I just knew that the way he was behaving, there was yeah, something. It's in, something on top of it besides that. Yeah. yeah, I get it. Um, not that the drinking was okay. Yeah, at right. All. I don't. Uh, that's yeah. not what I'm saying. No, either, I, know, but, I know. But but, but but it is normalized at some level. It's you know it's the, yeah. the the issue is what are you doing besides? And I mean, he could look me. He could swear <clears throat> on everything on his life and do all this. Yeah. No, nothing. Nothing. I haven't taken right. anything else. You know, like. Um, and that was professional liars. Yeah, and I think also what made not me, that they were good at it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I uh, you became a professional liar. Uh, yeah, I think I was good at it, and I think that's what made her feel insane is that she started to question her own reality far too much. Yeah, but your instincts were still saying bullshit. Yeah, and you know, I and I I remember at my thirtieth birthday when they sang me happy birthday and gave me a cake, and Nick's not there. I just started bawling, and I was bawling because. Oh. It was so sweet what they did for me, you know. But I was also bawling because at home I'm dealing with what he was doing that day, like every day, you know. Was it at a different level that day? Of course, you know, that was it was at like a 10. But at home, you know, this is starting to become the norm of Nick just being a mess. And so my tears on my 30th birthday were partially happy, but also sadness because it was just like, you know, we're freshly married. This is this is our life right now, and it was it was tough. It really was. It was probably one of the lowest lows of our entire relationship was that that weekend. Yeah, and so from that that was September, and then I mean, I drove that mess, you know, smoking and leaking oil all the way to December, which was my my still sobriety date. So that was, uh, you know, several things happened between then and December that that led me to sobriety. But the December is when I actually got fired because I OD'd slash passed out at my desk. Um, and we were so, basically on the brink of divorce at that point. Yeah, we were on the brink of divorce at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and so the the day that I got fired. Mindy also told me that she was pregnant again. <laughs> so I come home. I come home from work after having 
legitimately passed out from opiates and alcohol at my desk and knowing that I'm about to get fired to her telling me that she's pregnant. Wow. Yeah. And when he came home, I didn't. I was like, oh, you're home early. <laughs> you know, I have no idea that you All just. Right. Got, yeah. I got a surprise Guess what? for you. Yeah, right. I have no idea that you just got fired. Um, but I was happy he was home early, you know, and I told him that that we were. I had just found out I was pregnant. And I remember Nick saying, well, I got in a little trouble at work tonight. You know, it was just very like, I just got in a little bit of trouble, you know. Uh, and they sent me home, and I'm like, is everything okay? Uh, I don't know. We'll see, you know. And then later on find out the the full story of what exactly happened. But that night when he came home, it was, I only got like a small of course. sliver of what actually happened. Um, yeah, and then that kind of catapulted you into recovery, or well, finding something. Yeah, because that, so that was Friday night and uh, Sunday morning. She went with me to my first AA meeting. What was that like for you? Um, I mean, as, as your sponsor, Chris, always says, we both walked into that room not looking very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I wasn't. I mean, I was, when Nick, that morning, he came to me and said, I'm an alcoholic. I need to get help. And that's the first time I'd ever heard him admit that he was an alcoholic. I knew by this time that he was, but it was the first time he actually said it out loud. And when he said, I need to get help, I want to go to AA, it was like, I was kind of shocked, really. I mean, just to for him to verbalize it. But, um, you know, I kind of walked into that meeting like, we'll see if this sticks. The other things that he's tried haven't, who knows, you know. I hope it does, but... I don't know if it will. So I went to that meeting just to support him. You know, even though I was angry and sad and all those other things that went into where we were at that point in our relationship, no matter what happened with us, if he wanted to get himself healthy and get sober, I would support him on that. And so I went with him that day. And, you know, Nick's, I, you know, in the meeting they say is, what do they say in the meeting? Like, this is anybody's first AA meeting. Yeah, is this anybody's first AA meeting? And Nick stood up, and it was, I mean, I don't know. It was, I was happy I was there with you, but it was also a time where it was like, okay, we something's got to give. You know, yeah. he can't live this, he can't live this life like this anymore. I, We together, baby or not, can't live this life like this. So, yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah, so I, you know, I I did have the gift of desperation that first day of meeting, and like I said in my story last time, I I launched right into it. Um, I think I had my first of uh, many spiritual experiences that first day talking to um, Chris in the back room at the Token Club, um, where he made me understand that I could have a different concept of a higher power and this thing that was keeping me away from AA uh, didn't have to be a thing. And I felt almost instantly different. Mindy did not <laughs> feel instantly different. Um, I, I think that's part of what I wanted to do here is, you know, I, I'm starting to build days that are turning into a week, into weeks that are turning into a month of sobriety. And I'm starting to get really happy and really confident and starting to like build this thing up and but mindy has not i don't think it's a bad point of view because i think she has more realistic point of view she's seen these solemn oaths before she doesn't get to feel what i feel to get the juice like we always talk about she's Mm -hmm. not she's not getting juice yet because this is all happening inside me um and she's too pre-programmed for my insanity to be able to buy this right away right oh yeah i mean you know he would come home from meetings and he would be all you know juiced up as you guys say and and i'd be like okay you know just very skeptical of it like yeah we're going baby i've been sober three weeks you should be like (laughs) buy me a cake when i get home is my parade yeah like i (laughs) i wasn't gonna get my hopes up i wasn't gonna get too excited about anything and i'm like you know dude it's been 
nine days, you know, like. This, Get over yourself. Yeah, this alcoholism has been going on for years and you're, you know, happy about nine days, which of course he should have been. But at the time I'm like, pump your brakes, you know. Like, well, and she also well, your self protection walls are up, you yeah. Know? Because I mean, you get hurt over and over and over again, man. And this record player plays over and over. You know, you're waiting just for the song to start again. You know, when is it going to happen? Yeah, and yeah. that's you know, I was kind of like, I was kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, kind of thing. Like, okay, he's going to try this for a little bit, and then he's going to mm-hmm. not go to it, and it's just going to be another one of those things where he's like, you know, trying to not to quit, and it's not going to happen. Um, so I just. I remember back then, I just, he would come home and he'd talk to me about his meetings, you know, or how he felt or things like that. And I would listen, but I just, I did. I kept like that protective wall up. Yeah. Of, I'm not going to get too excited Completely about, natural. yeah, you know, I'm not going to get too excited about this. I'm going to support you and everything, but, I, you know, I'm not going to throw you a ticker tape parade for having three weeks of sobriety right now, you know, so, um, and I, I think, why not. <laughs> <laughs> and I think as a spouse, you know, it's it's hard because you see your significant other excited, which is great. But at the same time, you do have to, like, remember, okay, it's only been three weeks. Like, this could – tomorrow he could decide to go out and drink and it's all, you know, all over with. So it's it's kind of like a balancing act, I think, a little bit at the beginning. Well, yeah, and she had – zero exposure to AA before this. So, and I'll say this, she over the years has educated herself uh, very much about AA and she knows a lot today. Um, and she did that for me and because of me, she doesn't, she doesn't necessarily, I mean, now that we, with, with Christopher's book and stuff, we know, we know the advantages of someone that doesn't have the isms like Mindy to just make her life better by paying attention to the 12 steps. But, she wasn't she wasn't desperate for any of this stuff she did right. it to to draw closer to me and to walk this journey with me um so i don't know what situation or what culminated to give you confidence in my sobriety but i do know that i think i was four months sober when you had that miscarriage yeah i think so right around there somewhere around there um i know that gave me confidence in my sobriety because i i feel like i handled that situation completely different than I did when I was in the madness well I knew you know obviously that was a very tough day for us um because we were 20 weeks we were going we actually went that day to find out the sex of the baby to find that there wasn't a heartbeat Mm. and our my mom was with us it was just it was a really obviously tough day but you know we got home and kind of composed ourselves a little bit and Nick said I think I need to go to a meeting. And at that point, I did realize, okay, like, this is a big deal. You know, the fact that he's dealing with all this stuff internally and he wants to go talk to people about it, people who can help him, I thought that was a really big deal. Because before, he would have just put put it inside, not talked about it, not dealt with it. But he knew at that time, like, I need to go to a meeting. I need to be around people who understand what I'm going through, can help me with what I'm going through, you know. So that was that was a big deal. Yeah, side note on that, I went to that meeting, and it was uh, the old Broad Highway group. And uh, I sat down, you know, burning desire comes up. I tell him about that day. The guy sitting next to me turns to me and said, my wife and I just went through this about 12 weeks ago. and put his arm around me. And, I mean, just, I didn't know that. Yep. Just, just crazy, you know, these uh, yep. coincidences. coincidences that continue to happen in this program. But, uh, yeah, that ga- I mean, as, as awful as that situation truly was and that day was, it, I often, when I have when I have rough days, I, I kind of always gauge them on that day. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if, if you got through that day without even thinking about drinking and your first thought was to go to a meeting, well, you'd be a real selfish son of a bitch to let whatever's going on today get right. you. yeah. I think the other thing, too, where I realized that you you finding AA and, you know, working the program might actually work was the everything with the God side of it, you know, because previously we had I had tried to talk to Nick about AA, but it was always the God, 
the God part that was like, nope, I'm not doing that. But I think with Chris and the way he kind of explained it to you that your higher power can be whatever you want your higher power to be and it's not God in a religious sense, um, I think that really opened up your eyes to AA. And it let, allowed you at that time to let in a lot of stuff that you had for years and years tried to block out, you know. It's a universal block. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And Everybody comes in thinking it's something that's not. Yeah. yeah. It's the it's the it's the content prior to investigation. Absolutely. And I think you know, I mean, just given your upbringing, I understand why you felt that way. So for you to actually talk about, even just like talk about a higher power and have a normal conversation about it versus like angry and yeah. heated, instant vile. It was totally different, you know, yeah. because leading up to that point, there's just not. You couldn't have a conversation with Nick about religion or God without it being, without him blowing up. So for him to be able to just verbalize it was like night and day, really. So that's when I knew it was, it was a different path you were going down this time. I'll go back to that just real quickly too, because when you said that uh, I found out that the baby didn't have a heartbeat and that Nick wanted to like take some action, you know, I mean, the flip side of that was, is that we always wanted to say, yeah, you know, it's my thing is to sweep it under the rug. The same thing. It's all okay. You know, it's like, it didn't happen. It's okay. We'll just put it over here and mm-hmm. we will move on. You know, and the fact that you actually take some action around something that's, that's like acceptance of it rather than avoidance of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, makes a big difference, you know, and I think that's probably what, you know, some of the energy that was that was conveyed is that, wow, he's doing something healthy around this rather than the typical avoidance of the issue completely, you know. Yeah. And Even want- though he was, like, going away from you. Because the yeah. same thing probably happened is that physically it was like he probably, like, distance instantly. But the fact that it was distance in a way that was acceptance rather than avoidance. Yeah, and also the, what was different about that day is my mom was with us that day. And so he made sure I was okay and that my mom was there to support me so I wasn't alone, you know, Um, before he even went to his meeting. You know, he wanted to make sure I was okay, which was completely different than the past time when we had gone through it, you know. So um, I took time off of work, um, which in the past I wouldn't do that because that's my cover, you know. Like like when I go to work, it's easier for me to lie to those people. You know, they're not getting all the way in my face to smell my breath, you know. Uh, I took time off of work to just be there, you know, which is, was mm-hmm. new. I do think something that is, was, well, is, was interesting about the beginning stages of Nick going to AA was that, um, you know, or first getting sober, I guess I should say, is, you know, you mentioned this at the beginning that some couples realize like how different they are when one person gets sober i remember and actually i saw this in a movie recently in a move in a star is born Hmm. um spoiler alert if anyone's listening but (laughs) there's a point where bradley cooper gets sober and lady gaga kind of questions if he's still gonna like her now that he's sober and i remember having those feelings when nick first got sober because i realized okay the entire time we've been together it hasn't been the true you, you know, are you really going to like me if you don't have drugs or alcohol in your system? And I remember asking you kind of question, you know, questions like that, like, are you sure this is still what you want to do? And you're like, yeah, what are you talking about? But, you know, in my mind, it was like, okay, well, he's always had this something influencing him for all these years. Is he really going to like me for me, you know, without having anything else one of the little taglines that you'll hear tossed around is that, like, well, you know, when we were doing that, our picker was broke. You know, <laughs> who we picked uh, was broke, and that's kind of that's the that's like the, the the symptom of that is when like I wake up and I go, yeah, not so much anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, whoops, <laughs> how did I get out of this? <laughs> and I remember not seeing the that teddy bear I meant to win. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing that in the movie and just thinking how accurate that was because yeah. as as a spouse of someone who's going through that, there are moments where you're like, maybe, you know, maybe they're going to change their mind now that they're sober and realize, you know, they don't, they're not interested in you like they thought they were kind of thing. So, um, so I remember having moments like that. 
Well, and and for me, the complete opposite of any of that was the truth. I mean, the the thing that kept drawing us back into collision over those years, no matter how bad I got, the thing that kept drawing us back together, that that magnetism, it, it to me it was excavated. It was it was it was even stronger. Like now, I really was able to to see her as my true soulmate. To to be able to look back like I mean you and I talk a lot about that looking back hindsight and being able to see all these situations through sober glasses and I mean I remember some of my amends to other people a lot of it like especially people at work being like oh yeah all that stuff I said about my wife not a single bit of that was true Mm -hmm. it was all bullshit she ain't she is not crazy she is not mean to me she is not driving me to drink she did none of that stuff she is the best person in the world to me um i was able to see just how connected her and i are just how good of friends we are um i was able to see that finally and not have anything to fight i mean i had to make something you know when it says that we we cease fighting people and, and things everything and everybody yeah um i mean i had to make up things to fight and and one of those things i made up to fight was her and i yeah. As soon as soon as I, I mean, almost as soon as I got sober, I was able to see the fallacy of that. Yeah, it's kind of like an internal war, you know. And I need some enemies. How do you have a war without somebody yeah. to fight against? It's right? Not much fun to punch air. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So we do that with our work and our spouses and our family members, and yeah, invent enemies. Yeah, yeah. I think the people he worked with definitely thought I was crazy, or I was just like this awful wife or something just because of how he would spin it to them you know so I mean, yeah that's a little cliche you know if you had a wife like i had you'd drink too mm-hmm. yeah well and the funny thing is uh, you know i thought that i was doing a good job selling that but when i and i remember specifically a couple of the people at, at work that i went back and made amends to um and telling them about this and then, oh we know we know, she, we know she, you're the crazy one yeah <laughs> yeah of course I, I thought I had them hoodwinked though, but I, I obviously did not. Um, so I mean, we're all crazy in our own right. <laughs> true, true. But uh, so what? Um, I'm, I'm interested to see like your how else you felt in that first year of sobriety, the uh, changes that you saw in me, um, how that sat with you. Well, I think at the beginning, you know, there's the like I said, there's those feelings of well. Is he going to like me for me? But then I also had like a lot of anger and I had a lot of anger towards mostly it was towards his very, his immediate family because I thought, I thought it was odd that I was the only person who noticed that he had an issue with alcohol and drugs and I was the only one who voiced it. Hmm. And I felt like his family just kind of, swept it under the rug kind of thing you know we would be together at family events and so we do have our family traditions you know mm-hmm. yeah and, and you know when he come in and you all had trouble and he swept it under the rug you know yeah. he, he, he didn't learn that yeah, <laughs> at school it was, was kind of like i almost felt like it was this thing that everybody knew about they didn't want to talk about yeah you know? it's an like elephant Nick, in the room kind of stuff yeah, if the Nick's emperor has no issue, clothes on it's but we don't want to talk about it and so i got for a while, I was really pissed. Resentful. At them. Yeah, I was. I was mad. But then I also had to remember that the Nick that I saw and the Nick that they saw were two different people. Yeah. Because when he's around his family, he's going to manipulate things and put on a version of himself, which is going to be totally different than what I have at home. So they, I feel like they... They had like a window in to see what was going on, but they didn't have the full picture of what it was really like. So I had to kind of let some of that go because I realized they weren't, like I said, they weren't getting the full picture of what was actually going on. They were just getting these little tiny bits when we were together for family functions three times a year or whatever it was. Right. Um, I do still think there was some, you know, sweeping it under the rug, not talking about what was really going on. But I had to let go of some of that initial anger because I knew that he was twisting things to make him sound a lot better than how he actually was at sure. the time. Um, 
but you know when when he first decided to get sober um he wanted to go to meetings all the time which was great he wanted to meet with chris his sponsor all the time which was great and um at first i was kind of like nervous like well where are you going you know what are you doing kind of thing um and that was just my you know that was just the past talking to me and making me nervous of things that he was doing based on previous events and so i had to kind of let that go and realize you know him going to meetings is a good thing and wanting to go talk to a sponsor is a good thing you know and i had to kind of let i had to slowly build my trust up in him mm-hmm. um and that was hard at first you know just is he really going to an a meeting you know is yeah. he really going is to he really doing that? yeah you know that kind of thing but the more i saw him working through the steps and the more he would talk about things with me i could really start to see the differences in him and i think one of the biggest things was up until that point i don't think actually i know this nick was never comfortable with himself he was never comfortable with nick whatever that was he was he just was never comfortable in his own skin i felt like skin Yeah. yeah he always had to portray this this person to everybody but inside he wasn't happy at all and so once he started working the program and working the steps um i just saw a whole new version of him you know he he would joke around with me where up into that point he kind of took himself like very seriously you know it's like he finally shed this armor that he had been wearing for years and he could be himself you know if he wanted to go buy a cowboy hat he would do it or if he (laughs) wanted to um you know he just he was able to laugh at himself and be happy with who he was as as nick um and i had never seen that before it's just he he was never comfortable with himself ultimately that is the goal of recovery you Mm -hmm. know it looks like it's stopping drinking and using that's what it looks like it is but it's really not it's finding yourself it's recovering your own true spirit it's the tag it's the subtitle of christopher's book how to reclaim your original self find out who you really are Mm -hmm. and you know all of a sudden he just didn't care what people thought anymore he didn't care what if like i said if you want to go buy a cowboy hat and wear it he didn't care what anybody thought or if um you know if he wanted to make fun of himself he didn't care what anybody thought and it was just it was a whole different world because he just had never been like that before it was yeah. always you know this armor protecting him from people and what they thought of him and you know and so that was that was a big deal laughter but started becoming the new norm in our house yeah i mean up until that point you know like i said at the beginning i I joke around a lot. I like to have fun. I'm sarcastic, that kind of stuff. But we didn't have a whole lot of that before. And then once he got sober, I feel like our, I mean, we laugh every day now. You know, Nick can hurt himself or bonk himself in the head and he can actually laugh at it now versus like getting angry or something. And, you know, it's just, it's totally different. It's so freeing to, to operate under those conditions because I can relate with that completely. You know, that always, a, it's the other thing is like the mask wearing, you know, mm-hmm. the never being able to really show who I am because I'm afraid you won't like me if you see who I really am. And recovery allows me to take off those masks and be me and not give a shit if you like me or not, you know. Fact of the matter is most people do, right? right. I mean, <laughs> they yeah. actually like, hey, that dude's pretty cool because they see the the authenticity when mm-hmm. you're living in these Brene Brown words of authenticity yeah. and integrity. And you're able to be vulnerable with other people, and then that opens you up. And then you, know, you go, wow, well, you know, that, you just, it just seems so senseless that we were wearing those masks, you know. But uh, yeah. that's, you know, obviously the dope and all that and created a big piece of that but ultimately but the fact of the matter is i know that i was at you know life did that to me yes i got my spirit i like to say my spirit got stepped on as i grew and i think it's you know again i think it's a rare person that doesn't end up having that happen it's the, the you've won the lottery if your spirit didn't get stepped on at some level as you grew up it would be it by peer mechanism. pressure or parenting or uh, whatever happened to, to to do it, and then we start to use. I started using because of that. 
Yeah. You know, it looks like I became a drug addict and alcoholic. Really, what I was doing is trying to take some damn medicine to deal with what I had to begin with. Right. Uh, with all that getting my spirit stepped treating on. Treating my pain and, yep. and, yeah, fitting in. And then and we get that. to come full circle and, and, and take that off. I like that. I'm, I've been following that Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey and that that's just really what we do. That is really the cycle of life is being born perfect, having shit happen, figuring out how to overcome it. Some don't. Some die. Some commit suicide. Some whatever. But figuring out how to overcome it somehow or another with usually by the help of others mm -hmm. and uh and then coming full circle around where now i have a tool that i'm able to help the other guy who is struggling with the same thing again that that hero's journey that cycle and that's what we do in 12-step work yep. is, is is to go say hey man i got a path i've walked it you know my minefield story that i've that i've read about the soldier at the other side of the minefield uh, has guided thousands of people across mm -hmm. the minefield, and he's hollering at me, going, "Hey, listen to me! I can show you how to get across there." You know, and I got a couple of choices. I can just say, "Yeah, you look pretty smart, but you don't look like you know shit about minefields." <laughs> or I can listen to you and follow the path that uh, thousands of others have followed across the minefield, and let let this person who knows how to navigate, who's navigated it before, help me navigate it. Yeah, and I, I think the. Mindy allowing me to be vulnerable and blossom into who I was discovering about myself and and her expressing that she liked it and that's what she'd been waiting for. Right. Yep. That's what she had yeah, seen. Yeah, I was gonna say there was never any me there was never me allowing you to do it. It it was it was you not allowing yourself. Right, no, but I mean I think you welcoming that especially in early sobriety where I'm discovering myself and you like <clears throat> buying two tickets to that show. And you enjoying that, and 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 so you have to be open to it though, because yeah. there is this yeah. other dynamic where this other thing comes in, and then there's some relationships where the other, like the spouse, is not open to that, and they're like, you know, throw this bullshit over the fence at me, you yeah, know? and and I can't, you know, and and and, and having a little, because sometimes that friction just can't yeah. got, be gotten over. That I mean, there were friction. some outfit choices I wasn't that fond of, <laughs> but no, <laughs> I'm just kidding, but <laughs> no, but I mean, but that. Her modeling that to me allowed me to to drop all of that all together and go out in the world and be like, you know what? Like, if she's cool with it and she wants, she is supporting me discovering myself. Then the rest of y'all just need to get on the plan because that's what I'm doing. Yep. Because I, you know, like this girl. I mean, you know, I I know that in the in the twelve steps programs in AA, we're supposed to say that you know we got sober for for just me. That's not the truth. I mean, I had, I had a lot of motivation because I always knew underneath that this was my human. Without a doubt, she was my girl. Yeah. And I knew that. And so I did get sober with a lot of motivation f from her and to, to be with her and to make this relationship blossom. And then when, when it turns around and she's encouraging me to, to go on this journey of self-discovery and... I mean, yeah, she might have made fun of some some things along the way, but but for I love, but yeah, but for her to be her to sign up for that and to enjoy that and to be a part of that, it. I mean, now I I just I don't I really don't care if I'm not hurting somebody. I don't care what their opinion is of me. It's I, not my business. And I think you're right, though the authentic the authenticity side of it. I think that was really refreshing to the people who knew you know, who were really close to Nick to see the true Nick, you know, not that, like I said, not that armor that he was wearing all the time to see him be vulnerable and see, you know, the honesty in him and just, just who he really is, you know? Um, cause I think, you know, I think towards the end before he got sober, people knew that it was kind of bullshit, you know? And so to see him just be, be comfortable with himself and be happy with himself I think not only me, but other like my brothers and people in my family, and um, I think they really, they really wanted to see that, and they really appreciated seeing that. Yeah, and I mean now the the other relationships have mended as well that were important. You know, all those all those people that witnessed that on her thirtieth birthday. You know, there's a thing where I know I shouldn't regret that day because virtually every single person that was there. I are still on my life and those relationships are mended. 
you know they they know they know my story now and i don't have to be embarrassed i yeah. still am for some reason a yeah, little bit sure. and i and i think it's there, there are just certain things, especially with um, with a wife, that you almost have to have a do over in order to feel better about it. Like I, 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 like I, I think I was thinking the other day, like I almost need to throw her another party in the same cabin and have it be completely different, and then I can walk away and be like, all right, got that one. And that's why I kind of am really excited for this year's uh, sobriety birthday because I can say, okay, like we're at day one now. We, we have had equal days in madness and equal days in sobriety. So now, this is a fresh slate now. Uh, I, there's certain things like that that appeal to me, um, to be able to say that. Even though I, I'm, we're already living in... I mean, we, we, we literally all, all week long talk about how, <coughs> how lucky we are. We have two boys that are super happy. We have a relate. I mean, we're not perfect. We are not perfect. We, we get at each other's throats sometimes um but man our our climate in our relationship and in our house is happiness and laughter and vulnerability and deep discussion and and i think yeah and i think part of that too is you know once once you did get sober we had to have like a lot of really honest conversations with each other about things you know whatever it is if we're pissed off at each other one day the honest truth about why that is or you know if we're worried about something or if it's about sex whatever it is we just had to really be honest with each other and talk about each other's needs and wants and things like that and just get down to the the nitty-gritty whether it's ugly or or not you know and I think that's really helped us I think that's really helped our relationship blossom over the years is just that that honesty with each other. Well, and I think the that that those kind of behaviors were still like hangers on in the first year of sobriety of like me trying to paint a picture for her a little bit or trying to hide some deep dark secrets from her and that didn't just go away. Um, I think part of something I've noticed with other guys with me and other guys I've worked with is it's not just all the the bad deeds we did or the the chemicals we took part of the th- thrill for us was the the hiding the smoke show um the feeling like little covert agents all the time yeah. that's part of the thrill for us yeah. and so that first year it that stuff didn't go away qu- just like the drinking did cuz I didn't I don't know. I, I guess I didn't know necessarily that all that stuff was still there. Um, but over time and after some of those stumbles in that first year, now I know that the very best I'm going to feel today is when she knows every single thing about me at this moment in time. She knows pretty much all my thoughts as I tell her. She knows everything I've done today. There are no secrets. She can pick up my phone at any time of the day and sort through it and I have nothing to hide those being that's when I feel like my best authentic self I feel happy because I don't have to I don't remember any stories anymore I don't have to cover anything up I no longer do I feel get any thrill from being a covert agent this doesn't appeal to me anymore yeah in fact I get anxious yeah I do too it makes me sick to my stomach to think about it you know in a a general level you know after practices in this thing for a little bit if I've got something I'm holding there's a real uneasiness inside of me that I need to do like a 10 step kind of thing at the very least or jump it on the group or Mm -hmm. call my sponsor or call a buddy or do something where I can release that energy because it's just no good for me anymore uh, and I, and I know that I need to, to get rid of it. I made me think of when you talk about that, uh, it's real simple things. And I, these things collect up in my head. So, uh, I want to, I have this thing where I always want to apologize for myself and I want to do a pre-apology for things all the time. I'm trying to get, not do that. Uh, so I like, I want to say, sorry about all this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't need to apologize. Yeah, I know. I know I don't, you know, and I'm getting better at not doing that. But I still, I'll chuckle at myself when I begin to do it. When I start to, I go, oh, there that is again. But Bob Earl was quoting somebody and he says, the definition of intimacy is me being me and me letting you see me. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's when, you know, and that's the matter in the intimacy is not sex, right? It's, it's beginning having a real personal relationship with another person where you can actually say, okay, here's my stuff. Accept me or don't. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and like I said, my here, well, look at my phone, find out what I'm up to, have at it. You yeah. know, uh, you know, and I, and I listen to a lot of you guys. I listen to you, and specifically, and, I, and maybe I did hear this uh, that you know, I don't want to have anything in here that I can't show to Robin. Yeah. You know, if I've got something in this thing, and this phone is what I'm pointing at, that I'm that I got to hold close to me so people don't see, that's not the life I want. That's not the way I'm operating today. You know, and that's ultimately what a lot of this, another some of this recovery stuff is that I've got some new operating principles. Yep. I used to have no operating principles. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, if uh, I've got to look over my shoulder about something, I don't need to be doing it. Yeah, yeah. And instantly I'll get that like, yeah, shouldn't be doing that. You right. Know, uh, I mean, the, and I'll the, give them, I'm not a saint to books. We are not. So right. I am still inclined to start turning down the path, you know. But the but thing is, is I get to self-correct and yeah. make a course correction quicker today. Uh, and, then, then, and according to how far I walk down that little path is how much uh, cleanup I got to do as far as like 10 step yeah. stuff and, and amends potentially and anything else that comes along with that. I mean, the only thing that I'm willing to not tell her today is another guy's fifth step material. Right, right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's. I mean, that, and I, I mean, I've even told guys on the thread, I mean, unless they're putting some fifth step material on the thread, which it has happened from time yep. to time. And, I, and I'm, but other than that, like, you know, I'm going to tell my wife what goes on here too. And that's why I have certain rules for me. Like, I'm not going to be going someplace where people's going to, um, anybody's going to post like, pornographic images or anything like that because that's something that's not okay in our relationship and that's those are discussions that we've had over the years and we've learned and for me intimacy is related to sex and vulnerability and all that stuff is all all wrapped up because i need to tell her exactly what i need and she needs to tell me what she needs in all aspects of my life it it has to has to hit everything for me well i think both of you said something that sparked something I wanted to say is um, I think the cool thing that has happened uh, through Nick getting sober and also, um, you know, working a program is that when things do pop up in life now, like you said, he does have a way now of dealing with it. You know, he has these different steps that he takes when something happens, whether it's reaching out to you guys, you know, on the group thread or calling Chris and saying like, this happened today. I just need to talk about it. I need to get it off my chest, you know, calling me, whatever. Like he has tools to use now versus just bottling all up, keeping it inside and letting it hurt him in other ways. You know, he, and I've noticed that with you is that you do, you want, as soon as something happens, you want to get it out. You want to talk about it and just so you can, You can move on in whatever way you need to. And I think that's really great because, and I've said this before, but I think, and you know, I'm not an expert or anything, obviously, but I do think men are kind of taught as they're growing up not to show their emotions, you know, what you got to be strong and tough and you can't cry and you can't blah, blah, blah. Well, I think that's bullshit, you know? And so now if, if he's sad about something, he feels comfortable being sad or crying or, whatever it might be you know just letting all that out versus keeping it all in i think that has been huge for you you know and like having this support network of guys that you can lean on when stuff happens i mean up until um you know i I think i mentioned this before at one of the birthday meetings is that until he until he found the program he never really had like solid friendships It was all very surface level. It was like, let's go hang out and, you know, fish or whatever, but we're not going to talk about what's really going on in our lives. And we're not going to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, you know. And, um, I mean, now I I can honestly say, like, you've got these friendships that you'll probably have for the rest of your life and where you guys talk about deep stuff. I mean, I don't know the stuff you guys talk about, but I know that it, it goes it goes beyond, hey, buddy, how you doing? Yeah, you want to go? Stuff, yeah, yeah, you know, it's... Because everybody prior to this was now, I know, as we were acquaintances at best. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm comfortable hugging a, a, another man and saying I love him. Matter of fact, I actually expect it, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, when somebody sticks their hand out, I'm kind of like, do I know you? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what's, what's that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think that's so awesome because before you just... you 
you didn't do that. You know, you the only time I would see you really show like a true emotion other than anger was if you were completely hammered and it you were just in a really bad spot. You know, but now if something does happen, you allow yourself to feel it and show it. And I think that's really healthy. Yeah. And I also think the other thing too is through your work and what you do with your program and your sponsor and all of your friends now is you've taught me ways to kind of deal with things in my life. You know, if there's a situation going on in my life, you know, steps and tools that I can use to work through those things. And I think that's great. You know, like not only has he learned so much, but I've learned so much just from him. That's the so, ripple effect of recovery. Yeah. And I think that's why so many people now are want to get into the whole program, even if they're not an addict or an alcoholic, because there's some really good lessons there for people to learn and apply to their lives. They certainly see it and smell it. You know, whether mm-hmm. if they actually went, you know, it's a, it seems so daunting. Like we thought when we first got here, at least I thought when I first got here, I thought that that work was daunting. Yeah. You do know? I have to do and, all 12? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Fact of the matter, pretty simple now. Looking back on it, you know, but uh, it still looks daunting. Especially it looks daunting to people who maybe don't have the isms, and that's one of the big difficulties of like Christopher's book and the the thing of getting somebody to that point of desperation, like we were at that gift we had. It said uh, I didn't really have any other escape, or at least I sure couldn't see one. Yeah. Uh, I can tell myself I'm I can continue, and this is just some some perception. If I don't have something breathing down my neck, if I, my ass is not on fire. It is really, really easy to say it's not that bad. Right. And that's what we told ourselves yeah. forever. I'm it's good. not that bad. It's I got this. Yeah. I'm still managing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I really, you know, if you can have this, you, we, we, I have tools today that I get to deal with life in a healthy and positive manner. And I never had that. And it's not a fault of anybody not really teaching me. I'm not, you know, and I like this whole thing about the man thing and not. I don't even know where I got that. I didn't get it from my dad. Not really. Uh, uh, he didn't model that be a badass don't cry that you know kind of stuff uh wasn't modeled for me i don't know where i picked it up i picked it up anyway maybe just society in general somehow i think it is yeah Uh, i will say uh peers probably would be the bigger probably bigger influence on me as far as that went yeah other boys (laughs) yeah teaching me (laughs) how to be a man Uh, yeah that's a great place to learn yeah well and now now that we are in this spot it I have a different benchmark for my relationships with other people, not just not just the other guys in the program, but uh, I'm not I'm not content having a surface level relationship with somebody. That's not that's not what we're gonna do. I mean, I'll be I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna be nice to people that I'm not really close friends with, but if I if you're gonna be my friend and, and I'm gonna spend time with you, then it's gonna be deep. Or what are we doing here? Like yeah. I, I, I share of myself. And I want I want to, I want you to do the same. I don't want to talk about politics or yeah. whatever other small talk bullshit. You know, yeah. I have a I have a deep, honest relationship with my wife and my friends, and I want more of that. I don't need to talk about the weather. You know, and that it's it's given a whole new, um, like I said, a whole new benchmark to what these things have to kind of not have to. It's kind of hard to say. Get but, to. Yeah, get to. There you go. Get get to measure up to like these these are so um rewarding these relationships and so that's that's the goal yeah and and i don't know i mean i do feel for some of these uh people that get sober and their other their their spouse isn't really willing to go to that level that's got to be rough because um i know that i'm spoiled i tell people a lot and it's the truth is mindy is just the best human i've ever met to go through what I put her through and to then come out the other side and say, yeah, I want, I want to see who you really are. I, I'm pretty shocked by that. And I, and I, it makes it very easy for me to wake up every day. Super grateful that that's in my life. Yep. And I can vouch that that is the message he carries. Yeah, <laughs> really? Honestly, I can, I can vouch for that. Uh, I hear it. I see it modeled by him and uh and i and i and i and i and i take from that i try to learn from that i watch that's the other cool thing about this one this thing is that i have friends around me that i can actually watch and improve myself by watching Mm -hmm. 
uh, glean knowledge and, 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 and work on areas on myself. And I do. I am a year off relationship. Uh, it's something that I watch and I hear, you know, mostly from Nick and, and what's going on and the fact that the father that you are today or have been. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and and it is. It's 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 uplifting and, and I do. I, I keep you as a role model in my heart. Well, thank you. It means I th- a lot. I think um, one thing that I think helped us, too, in the very beginning is... Um, you know, one, I had to trust what he was doing. You know, I had to put some trust back in him for going to meetings and. In the beginning of the sobriety, by beginning. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Beginning of okay. the sobriety is, um, you know, just putting some trust in, as his, as his spouse. What I needed to do was put trust in what he was doing, what he was working on, things like that. You know, if he felt like he needed to go to a meeting, okay, go to a meeting. You know. If you need to go meet with your sponsor, go meet with your sponsor. You know, putting that trust in him that, one, he was going to do what he was saying, but also knowing that it's not only going to help him, but it's also going to help us because the happier he is with himself, the happier we're going to be together, you know. And um, so in the beginning, we just, I think that helped us quite a bit, you know. And then also for me was being invested in what he was doing, you know? So when there was a birthday meeting that I could attend or actually when you were at Broad Highway, it was a co-ed meeting. So Mm -hmm. I could go anytime I wanted if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he opened, he had that door open to say, okay, you want to see what's going on? Come with me to a meeting, you know? And so I did that just so I could kind of feel and see what, what that world was like for him. You know, I didn't need to get in and know what everyone was talking about or anything like that, but just, you know, so everybody can still have their privacy, but just seeing that world a little bit. Sure. And so now I've made it a point where, you know, anytime he has a a birthday meeting, I make sure to be there because it's a really big deal for him and it's a really big deal for us, you know. Um, And I think that has helped us a lot too is just, I think just, you know, respecting what you're trying to do and respecting it enough to also know that I don't need to know everything, you know, like I don't need to know the 400 text messages you guys have every day (laughs) on the group thread and what you guys are talking about, like just that, that you're doing what you're doing and, and be good with that kind of thing. So, because I, I, yes, do the text messages get annoying sometimes? Yes. (laughs) But I know it's a good thing. And I know that, you know, there are other spouses out there who probably struggle with that, you know, like their spouse being on their phone all the time, which I do too at times. But in the end, I know it's a really, really healthy thing. So why am I going to give him shit all the time about it? Um, if it's if it's something that's positive and healthy, you know what I mean? So Yes, I do. And I deal with the same thing, you know, the mm-hmm. similar kind of thing in my relationship of, you know, those little comments, it's, you're always on your phone. You're, <laughs> I mean, I think there's got to be some boundaries sometimes. There is, and I know yeah. I lean on mine. I know that it's a, it's a place where I need some more boundaries on, on, on dealing with how much time I'm on it. Uh, yep. But, I, I, you know, I can, we also have some others that are, you know, where it's, you know, I know some people who have had um, some real issues around it where, you know, the significant other is not okay with it. You know, mm-hmm. and I think at some level they would like, especially in somebody who is early in recovery, especially, uh, you've cut off a lifeline to for them. Yeah. Well, and it might, it might be and, a trust issue at that point. And then you point. cause a resentment because now I want this lifeline and you're not going to, you know, and it's a problem for you, mm-hmm. you know. So now, you know, now I'm pissed because you got a problem with something that I really want and, 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 and it's helping me. But... Yeah, it's a, but you're right. It's a balance, and that's the elusive thing, man. But like in the beginning, when you're like you, I mean, there probably was no ba- There was no balance for me whenever I first started getting sober. No, and the balance was all there. I had to put a lot. It was heavily weighted on me uh, and me and my participation in my recovery. Yeah, and it had to be out of balance for a while. Well, yeah, I mean, it comes back to a level of balance, and that's yeah. hopefully what happens. If it doesn't, then I, mean, I did more than ninety and ninety. You know, 90 meetings in 90 days. I probably did 120 yeah. in 90 days. I mean, I, I was given the gift of unemployment. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I went to, I'd go to 
two meetings a day for the first two and a half, three months. Yeah. There was, there was zero balance. Yeah. But it's exactly what I needed. It's another dynamic that will happen in a relationship. You know, we're, we're, we're gone, whether if it's physically and mentally, emotionally, we're not present when we're using. Yeah. And then we start getting well, and now we're not present at all. Because, you know, my mind is consumed with recovery. My, my, my body is out doing it. And they're like, well, hell, you know, this ain't no better than that. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the message that hopefully we've gotten across to people that feel that way is, you know, let this person have the three, four, five months they need in the beginning because the payoff down the road is going to be yep. astronomical. Yep. Is you're going to get to see a person that gets untethered from all of that bullshit yep. and gets to, to really discover themselves. Yeah, they might have to be not present for a few months. You got to let them have that. Yep. You got to. Book talks in that one part about years of use and that. Well, you know, and, and, and it may take years to rebuild it. And there's some truth to that, man, but I'm not finding that to be the case that the years thing is an overestimation. Uh, we're watching guys get well much quicker than years yeah i mean i think like four four or five months is kind of the average around our group yeah that may take a year to you know the trust kind of stuff yeah of, of rebuilding from that standpoint but uh, a, a, a gigantic uh transformation happens in that i'll just say first six months let's just yeah yeah just to be conservative the the communication part of that plays into it as well um because I could see how, especially a, a spouse or a girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever, um, you know, like with the text messaging, might kind of get jealous of that almost mm-hmm. because yeah. it's like, well, you're telling these people all this stuff. You're talking to all these people about everything. Why aren't you talking to me? But I think if you keep that honest and open communication with your spouse or partner or whatever, there won't be that jealousy there because... You know, you're talking to them, but you're also talking to, you know, you and I are talking about the same kind of things that's, mm-hmm. that are going on in your life, you know. And I, I think that plays into it as well. It can kind of help with some of those um, situations where if you, keep, if you keep the communication going between everybody, there's no one to feel, you know, like jaded from it, I guess. Yeah. Does I that agree. make sense? No, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if. If I'm not talking to to you about stuff and I'm only reaching out to the guys, then there's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because I can find myself being real responsive to like a sponsee call. Yeah, and maybe not quite so responsive to my girlfriend. Yeah, when she <laughs> needs something, you know. Yeah, I have to uh, I have to be careful there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and be careful is not the right word, but uh, that's what those are places that I need to see, continue to seek balance. Be mindful. Yes. But I am very thankful that you guys all have each other. I think it's pretty awesome. It is. And you get around some circles. And, of course, I don't, I don't have a giant reference to pull from. But I certainly have a pretty good one. And I somehow I found myself knowing a lot of freaking people in recovery on both sides of the river here. And, uh, and not too many people have what we have. Mm-hmm. I've got a lot of friends that are looking for this now the other thing is we're all receptive to it too and we participate in it so it's a give and take thing too yeah mm-hmm. you don't get to come and be this if you don't if you don't ante up yeah. you don't get to have this without pushing your chips to the yeah, middle of the table absolutely. too yeah all in yep yeah. that is it we're coming up on two hours and i feel Whoa. like we run out of uh, think, steam there i think so and kind of sound like included yeah. one of the things that i always do here and i stole it from steve ranella is another one of my pot. I listen to. You know, it's another place where some balance may be needed in my <laughs> life, as I listen to a lot of audio. Uh, I have a I have a gift to be able to do that. Some of us sit in the shop. I listen. I turn on spoken word stuff, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, and and listen to it. But uh, he always does a concluder. So we'll go around the table and uh, offer up if you got any final thoughts, any final things, and you do not have to have them. Uh, you can easily say. I think I, I like, uh, in a, and we talked about this yesterday uh, when we were doing, uh, Christopher came in and told his story yesterday. Uh, we did something in yoga teacher training where when we would share, we would say at the end when you were done and we wouldn't interrupt each other, you know, we'd say, uh, uh, I'm complete in this moment. 
Didn't mean I'm done forever. Didn't yeah. mean I think I got everything out that I needed to get out. It just means that I, I feel so that way you feel like you heard and you go where you were heard and that you got you you got out what you you could and then the next person could share or whatever. Mm-hmm. So any concluding thoughts? Nicholas? Um I'm just uh very fortunate that of all the things that my disease I allowed my disease to take from me, you weren't one of them. Mm-hmm. And uh this has been this has been an incredible journey with you and I, I do I do hope that um we give some hope to the the couples that are new in recovery that better is coming stay the course yeah Mm -hmm. yeah um i mean i i feel the same i'm so thankful grateful happy you know all of it that we are where we are today you know um through all the good the bad and the ugly i'm i'm happy we're here because there's, you know, nobody else I'd want to be here with. Um, but just, yeah, I mean, I think for folks that are out there and that are new in recovery, if you're in a relationship, just trust each other, be honest with each other, whether you want to or not, you know, and just really talk about it, talk about everything and don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to do that. But other than that, I feel pretty good about this combo today <laughs> yeah me too yeah thank y'all for coming in i think it's an, it's obviously a very important thing and like i said when we opened uh it tends to be one of the biggest blocks and one of the biggest problems for all of us at least and from my viewpoint is navigating a relationship at the same time we're trying to get sober because it's just trying to to come in here and, and and find this thing called recovery is hard enough in and of itself mm-hmm. uh that uh you know, you put in dynamics of a relationship and then you put in dynamics of a relationship that's been damaged by the use and all that on top of it. Uh, actually, you know, it's really, it's really a blessing. To, you know, it sounds kind of funny because it's, it's, but I was just saying, when I have somebody, you know, that's why we say don't get in a relationship for the first year. I don't really buy the year thing, but it's yeah. okay. Uh, but, you know, let's not jump in. Don't, don't pile that in. If you don't have it, you know, like you said, that the gift of unemployment, yeah. you know, that's another one, you know. Yeah. And so actually what I say, what I say about the resentment thing, I actually say them both. I say the number one and number two uh, offenders are employment and res- in relationships. Yeah. Because if that's what people are bitching about, finances and romances, mm-hmm. that's the, those are the deals that get under our skin. And if you don't have a job, it's kind of a good thing to not have a job and focus on this stuff. And if you're not currently in a relationship, I'm not going to break your relationship up, ship up. But uh, if you're not currently in a relationship, uh, let's not pile one in on top of recovery at the moment. Yeah. But fact of the matter is most of us have that or not most of them, many, most, whatever. And uh, my my gift was, uh, was an ankle bracelet <laughs> yeah. during early recovery. I couldn't believe how valuable that was. It kept me walking the line, you know, and mm-hmm. it kept me from having to go to wedding receptions or ball games or other kind of things where people were using and I had to have those to go navigate those temptations in my life that we all uh, tend to have to do I had a I had an excuse yeah. I couldn't go <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you all for coming in here yeah and sharing this it is a great idea Nick it was to, to bring it to the table I'm always looking for uh, new ways to uh, well frankly to participate in my recovery by doing this that's really what I'm doing here it's just a unique way for me to participate in my recovery at the same time of uh, sharing these messages and what this 12 step stuff has done you know uh, you know, and I hate to say it uh, but I will see there I go apologizing again uh, <laughs> a, a, a level of recovery that is uh, frankly um, different and above i'll just above what i see in a lot of places and that's something that we have found and that's mm-hmm. what i want to share i don't want to share middle of the road recovery mm-hmm. I, want, I want this premium juice out there shared because it is available to us uh and, and we have found it yes we have and it would be flat out uh it would be uh, continuing to be a selfish uh self-centered behavior to covet it and not share it mm-hmm so thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you all you. for allowing me to participate in my recovery in this manner. Spiritualunderground.org. There will be uh, pictures of Nick and Mindy on that. And show notes. Um, 
12 Step Spiritual Recovery, James Christopher Cohn. I just uh, saw a text while we were sitting here that there's been an update to it. So uh, uh, you can go out and get that. And at Amazon on uh, hard copy and Kindle and Darren Frank's music's wrapped around this. And I've been starting to, I'm paying myself. I take it out of this left hand pocket, put it in this right hand pocket. <laughs> That's backwards. Um, DTM Woodwork, it's a woodworking business I got going on. And uh, anything that, could, that you might need that direction, you can go to dtmww.net or contact me. I am a fairly available person. Thank you all. Love you all. Thank Talk to you later. You. Peace out. I've never fit in, no matter what I did, it was never good enough. Always somebody else that shined a little more than me. When someone new comes around, I always let them down, it's almost like a curse. I've got no one to love me just for me Sometimes I feel like my prayers go unheard That I only get what I deserve Nothing more than a cruel mistake Only sit down here for my heart to break How could God ever love someone like me? to believe life's not as dark as it seems but it hasn't happened yet so far the endless night leaves little light for me I keep moving on cause I know the dawn won't stay away for good Maybe tomorrow will bring a ray of hope for me. Sometimes I think I could be someone else. Maybe I'm the one doing this to myself. something good in me I just need the faith to see that maybe God can love even someone like me I know God can love even someone